day together. We've saved the best to last. <laughs> and I have the, oh, my name is Suzanne Clausen. I'm in the Department of History here at Carlton. And I have the uh, great pleasure um, of facilitating this last panel. So what I'll do is I'm going to introduce both speakers and the titles of their topics now, and then I'll turn it over to both of them, essentially. And they'll speak for about 25 minutes. So our first speaker is uh, Zina Megabane. She's an associate professor in the Department of Sociology at Boston College and is cross-appointed in the Department of African and African, Di Af African Diaspora Studies. Her areas of specialization include sociology of post-coloniality, race and, race and ethnicity, globalization, race and popular culture, gender and sexuality. And her publications include Bringing the Empire Home, Race, Class, and Gender in Britain and Colonial South Africa uh, with the University of Chicago Press 2004. And she's the editor as well of a couple collections. And our second uh, speaker is uh, Alison Goebel, Associate Professor in the School of Environmental Studies at Queen's University, cross-appointed in the Departments of Gender Studies and Sociology. And Alison's main research interests are environmental justice, Women health, women health and environment, local food issues and movements, gender, environment, and development in Southern Africa, including use or management of natural resources, social forestry, and agriculture. Her publications include Gender and Land Reform, the Zimbabwe Experience, uh, and um, both have published numerous articles as well in really fine journals. So, um, Zine's talk is Critical Reflections on Gender Politics and Policy in the Post-Apartheid Era, and Allison's is entitled Uprising of the Urban Poor, the Right to the City and Environmental Justice. Oh, thanks a lot. And thanks for the invitation. It's been a most invigorating day today. Um, so I think I'll start out my talk as many people have, which is um, pausing for a moment, however brief, to praise some of the important gains that were made with the passing of the, um, the government into the hands of the ANC in 1994. Um, many people, especially at the time and since, have pointed out that the transformation in the gender makeup of parliament at that time was one of the most remarkable achievements of the transition. The Sunday Times, for example, praised the new government for its gender inclusivity and the new parliament for having transformed, as they put it, virtually overnight from being one of the world's most sexist to one of the world's most progressive. In the immediate aftermath of the election, South African women made tremendous gains in parliamentary representation, moving from 141st place in the list of countries with women in parliament to 7th. 106 women proudly took their places at the first session, opening session in May of 1994. An increased representation was not the only victory. Scholarly <coughs> assessments of the transition were nearly uniform in their praise of the extent to which South African gender activists had managed to make the issue of gender equality central in debates about democracy. The Constitution integrated women's rights into it into a way that few constitutions in the world up to that point had managed to achieve. Um, there was a real effort to make gender responsive laws, policies, and budgets um, to be adopted. And the South African transformation was transition to democracy was widely hailed as being one of the few that had resulted in a marked improvement in women's descriptive and substantive representation. So many people have pointed to, however, the seeming contradiction of South Africa's gender-inclusive and progressive constitution and its escalating levels of vi gender-based violence. Thirteen years ago, a report on the American television program 60 Minutes infamously cited uh, statistics and named South Africa rape capital of the world. It is more accurate, of course, to say that South Africa has the highest reported rape in, rate of rape in the world, a critical difference. Nevertheless, since that time, any media search on South Africa, Google search, etc., will bring up a number of stories about the um, incidences of corrective rape, gang rape, domestic violence, hate crimes against gay and lesbian people. Uh, the specific forms of violence carried out against uh, women and LGBT persons, of course, and children cannot be separated from the fact that 56.4% of women aged 15 and older are without income of any sort. So going back to um, uh, the wonderful presentation that we had in the morning, that green line that you had high above, which disaggregated male and female uh, unemployment and poverty, that the unemployment rate for women is 6% higher than that of men, and that the majority of victims of assault are under the age of 25. 
meaning that young adults, adolescents, and teenagers bear the brunt of abuse. A recent report by Amnesty International called Making Love a Crime, which examined the criminalization of same-sex conduct in Sub-Saharan Africa, encapsulate how difficult it is to characterize contemporary South African society and its gender politics. On the one hand, the report praised South Africa for having, quote, taken a leadership role in calling for an inclusive human rights agenda at the United Nations. The report went so far as to call South Africa exemplary and suggested that the nation should be applauded for its active commitment to including protections against discrimination on the grounds of sexual orientation and gender identity in the Constitution. Elsewhere in the same report, however, the, they reference the fact that police abuse of gay and lesbian people, coupled with inadequate responses by police and government to crimes against gays and lesbians, made for an inhospitable environment in the country. Furthermore, the report noted that levels of violence against women are persistently high, particularly those living in townships and rural areas. Although a commitment to fighting gender inequality among all, society, all sectors in society is clearly spelled out in paper, Rural women remain disproportionately poor and marginalized. Current laws have not rectified the large-scale dispossession and tragic social location that women have been subjected to since the Land Act was passed in 1913. So the Amnesty International report summed up the situation well when they said, there is a continuing gap between law and lived reality in South Africa. So how do we go about um, thinking about it? So. We ha I, th I, th I saw it as I tried to puzzle out, and I by no means came to a, a conclusive answer, but to think about oh, the ways in which internal dynamics in history, the history of the liberation struggle, the history of uh, the specific ways in which apartheid violence and colonial violence was gendered, so those internal response to internal dynamics, but also the responses of the, the ANC as well, right? So as a liberation struggle that was a profoundly gendered liberation struggle, to put that, those dynamics in conversation with many of the global dynamics that we've been talking about. So how can, for example, uh, looking at the responses to globalization or the, com or the continued parroting of the there is no alternative narrative, though, you know, the, fly the ways in which those types of capital controls were released. How are those, all of those things gendered stories? We saw even in the film yesterday on multiple levels that there was a strong gender narrative running through that. Everything from when they went to fight, and excuse my language, that one of the miners said to the other about, you know, look, I think it was like it was the policeman said, look at him lying there, he's a pussy. Um, the also, you know, when the hat was passed for the uh, the, the wives of the minors, right, who are equally apart. So all of these stories of violence and economic oppression and resistance to it are also profoundly gendered. So what I wanted to look at was the ways in which, um, you know, the, how, the ways in which uh, responses and political um, imperatives operate in a gendered way. So for example, when Heinz had that statistic about the decline in the support for the IFP, and the ways in which there was an attempt to mobilize and to capture that rural constituency. I would put forward that that has been done largely on the backs of women. So when we talk about how politics is made real and narratives, we must look at the ways in which uh, ideologies and images of gender get mo mobilized. So what we've seen here um, in South Africa uh, that's particularly pernicious is what I would say is a technocrat technocratic and managerial way of analyzing and responding to gender-based violence. In 2013, without a hint of irony, President Zuma launched an anti-rape campaign in, in a Mitchell's Plain school. The campaign slogan was, say no to rape. <laughs> at an address, it gets worse, much, much worse. At, a, at an address before the 57th session of the UN Commission on the Status of Women, the National Deputy Minister of Police discussed the South African Police Force's new initiative, Men for Change, which aimed to engage police officers in, quote, mostly on issues of their health and wellness, both at their respective working and dwelling residential places, as well as to strive for the upper echelons in police management ranks to, quote, manage their officers fearlessly, fairly, and with focus, end of quote. In the, in the speech, the police commissioner offered this as a form of gendered analysis, she said, hand in hand, men and boys against gender-based violence must surely be a kickstart platform to see men and women as more interconnected and related within a gender system. We must understand that men also experience disempowerment. 
Women do also exert violence against men, even though this kind of violence is not this, to the same extent and usually does not have the same emotional or physical consequences. But the mere fact we understand this reality is also to begin to reduce the polarization of gender while increasing the engagement of men. So that's what those offered as a so-called gendered analysis. One year later, as part of a campaign to create awareness around family violence, child protection, and sexual offenses in the police, uh, the police commissioner announced that as part of a move towards gender equity, quote, pregnant schoolgirls will also be expelled from school along with their boyfriends, end quote. So what we see also at the level of government is that 2014 witnessed a steep decline in the number of, number of women premiers. In the eight provinces where it governs, the ANC appointed just one female premier, a 50% decline from 2009. Um, political commenter Susanka Msumang saw the ANC Women's League's failure to anticipate this um, development as yet another statement to its weakness. The ANC Women's League, as many people have pointed out, is itself in shambles in many parts of the country. An audit done in 2014 showed the League in the Western Cape and Eastern Cape did not have the required number of members. And so if we look back, um, uh, many people have tried to, get, to grapple with, you know, particularly what, what has happened to the ANC Women's League? How can we understand it as both a product of its history and a product of the specific conditions that occurred as the ANC um, came back into the country? And many people have pointed out that when the ANC um, returned from exile, they decided to retain the branch as the basic <coughs> unit, of, unit of organization, decision making, and choosing leadership. It was imagined that the local ANC branches would hold local government accountable. And, the, and as this has not turned out to be the case, the collapse of the lead branches is particularly worrying given the avowed commitment of the ANC to, quote, battle pat patriarchy from the branch structures upwards. Four years ago, an editorial in the Mail and Guardian was already decrying the serious dearth of new female leadership in the country. There is considerable cause for concern as to where this new leadership will come from, since the only way it appears that within the organization a woman can, can that it appears that the only way that a woman can come to a position of leadership in the organization is to ascend to power through those ranks. ANC Women's League President Angie Mocheka admitted that by, go, that by going to the branches to motivate, the only way you can get power is by going to the branches to motivate, it, motivate for it. You have to work within the organization. So in, in many ways, the, a lot of the meanings around what it means to um, fight for gender equality have gone, undergone important and decisive shifts. So, Oftentimes, similar terms are being used, but the meanings around those terms are changing. So, for example, in her 2009 Ruth First Memorial Lecture, Frederick and Walla criticized the newly inaugurated Ministry of Women Affairs, which folded in children and the disabled, and said so into one, into one ministry because, quote, all groups are deemed vulnerable. And she disputed, you know, what it meant to collapse the vulnerability of children and the disabled with the vulnerability of women, noting that this type of a move seeks only to, describe, dis, to, dis, to sort of naturalize and disguise patriarchy's role in creating uh, the vulnerability of women. And she pointed out, quote, the resemblance of the language to what was being said by the apartheid regime in the 1960s, when women, children, the elderly, and disabled were grouped together is frightening. What does this portend for the future? Another gender activist agreed that the move to incorporate the Department of Women, Children, and, the Disabled, and People with Disabilities um, into the Department of Social Development represented what she called a worrying degrading of the political re relevance of political equality because the Department of Social Development has no capacity to monitor what government departments are doing in terms of gender equality and women's rights. In August of 2014, in an interview with the Mail and Guardian, she described the women's movement as both stalled and not organized, and lamented the fact that the Women's Charter, adopted in 1994 and delivered to Parliament in 1997, has essentially been forgotten. Likewise, the Commission for Gender Equity, designed to be a mechanism for accountability, independent of party politics and the President's Office on the Status of Women, which had had overall responsibility for ensuring gender equality across all government departments and programs, 
have become the casualties of the, the politics of patronage. So, one, um, you know, one problem that anyone who is trying to understand the dynamics of the sort of the politics around gender in um, South Africa has to grapple with, which is this very seemingly high level, as particularly by international standards, of female penetration into the upper echelons of government, and the persistence and escalation of gendered violence, poverty, and inequality. It would, on the face of it, appear to be a rather remarkable paradox. That is until we take rather seriously this question of institu institutional culture and a particular type of institutional culture inherited from the past. For much of its, the history of women in the ANC, the emphasis has been first and foremost on inclusion. The May 2, 1990 ANC statement on the emancipation of women declared that, quote, the highest priority must be given to finding the means to facilitate women's participation in the struggle and within all the political, administrative, and military sectors of the a ANC from the grassroots to the NEC. The main focus has, uh, has long been on ensuring that women would be able to participate fully in the decision and policy making organs of our country. Nothing that one would necessarily want to dispute on the face of it. However, uh, and, and so I'll get to that in a moment. So an important and by no means, but by no means singular goal of people, largely women, who are striving for gender justice within the ANC was to become more firmly integrated and achieve higher levels of representation in the liberation struggle such that their needs would be acknowledged and met. Practically speaking, this meant that women should come to play active roles in the seizure of power, the shorthand that encapsulated the strategy and tactics that the ANC adopted in exile. So over the years that we see, particularly from the um, Congress in Luanda in 1981 through 1984, South Africa's Year of the Women, um, up into the, the, um, the NEC statement on women in 1990, was a continuing emphasis on uh, women as a sector to be mobilized, uh, the fact the, of to discussing the importance of liber women's liberation to national liberation, and in particular upon a strong ideological campaign to you might say disable or disrupt the idea that a discussion about feminism or feminist politics was Western or the um, catchword divisive. So if you read um, you know, testimony from women at the time or women reflecting back on their period, uh, they speak a lot about the strong struggle that happened amongst women within the organization to describe or to talk about a, de a emphasis on gender equality as not something divisive within the struggle, but actually an important part of it. So as Barbara Masekela uh, spoke of in an oral history that was taken, she said, quote, feminist was not regarded as a positive expression. To be feminist was at some point was to be viewed as very divisive. And I would say, I would, I would venture to say that gender activists in the organization did actually, you know, work fairly successfully to shift popular understandings within the movement from seeing gender uh, organizing or discussion of gender from being divisive to being seen as an important part of national liberation. However, what was not achieved, however, was a shift in understanding around the very notion of party loyalty itself. So in other words, rather than questioning what status does party loyalty hold, there was simply an, an effort to say, well, to women are, are not, uh, you know, w women do not um, in any way um, in their activism around gender question or are a threat to party loyalty. Gender activists, people mounted a convincing argument that they should not accuse of being, being divisive, but did not question or challenge the notion of divisiveness itself. The focus remained on demonstrating that a commitment to gender in inclusivity was not at odds with party loyalty or commitment. Hence, there was a continued emphasis at the time on women as the most loyal fighters, and in the words of Mavivi Manzini, a leader in the women's section from 1970 onwards, quote, women being the best cadres because they do lots of work. <laughs> The behavior of the ANC Women's League post-1994 seemed to indicate that the top leadership had no interest in contesting this image. 
In her 2014 Helen Joseph Memorial Lecture, Shireen Hassim, for example, analyzed how, in the contest for leadership at Polokwane, the League threw its weight behind a particular faction without much regard to the implications of their choice on the future of gender equity or equality. The League, she pointed out, had a strategic choice facing it, and yet again it stumbled by backing a candidate, candidate on the grounds of party power rather than on the extent to which he or she, he, he or she would support um, a set of core values around gender. So what we have now, 20 years since 1994, is a situation whereby gender equality has come to unduly emphasize access to political positions within the system. Some has gone so far as to say that the ANC has, quote, snuffed out the potential of female politicians, and on the whole, the ruling party's women have diminished in power. Some have described the, this as, quote, the politics of quotas and inclusion in the formal political sphere. While access to these positions is clearly important, we now, we now find ourselves with many women in government positions who are reluctant to openly challenge the ruling party. Everywhere you see the submission of strong women to party imperatives, even though it's oftentimes not the best things for the gra grassroots support base. The Mail and Guardian editorialized on Women's Day in 2008 um, that <clears throat> So said the so said the Mail and Guardian on the woman, on in an editorial that appeared on the Women's on Women's Day in two thousand and eight. In a recent book by Alex Borain called What Went Wrong, he discusses how the overwhelming emphasis on party loyalty, although it was an uh, an absolutely understandable reaction to the conditions of the ANC faced in exile, has been uh, has had a particularly pernicious impact in the post-apartheid post era in the sense that there is very little space within the organization to question received wisdom. And I think we've heard about that uh, um, on multiple times during the, the panels. And so what I would like to suggest that yet another, um, you know, another aspect of this has been that there was a particular way in which this has worked um, in a very particular gendered way. And we can see one of the um, you might say legacies of this being the ways in which the women's uh, the the movement for gender equality within the within the organization has particularly suffered from uh, this in the sense that any that oftentimes even mobilizing around issues that are of com clear import in terms of gender dynamics can easily be silenced because of that long history of having to always declare that they were at, not at odds with party loyalty. And so we see this, you know, one of the first strong waves of this happening in 1990 when the ANC Women's League was relaunched as an autonomous organization inside the country. And we heard, um, I think it was again either in Hein or Dan's presentation, where they talked about the demobil, I think it was Dan, about one of the critical mistakes being the demobilization of the UDF. And that had a very particular uh, gendered dimension. A number of uh, people have since reflected, who witnessed it at the time, that um, when the ANC Women's League re-entered the country, that they really de demobilized internal women's organizations organizations like NOW, for uh, the Nepal Organization for Women. So Preg's governor in her um, autobiography recalled how, quote, when the internal women's organizations like NOW were dissolved, their experiences with the ANC Women's League were not sisterly. Many described the encounter as a bruising process, end of quote. Pat Horn, another longtime ANC activist, described the unific unification process as tension-filled. She wrote, some of the UDF-affiliated women's organizations consequently decided to disband in favor of putting energy into strengthening the structures of the ANC Women's League. But this was not a smooth process and was accompanied by many localized conflicts. Tellingly, a Natal organization for women, for women activists expressed the view that women at the time felt that they would be, quote, betraying the ANC if they stayed independent. Another woman um, who was within the league said, when we came into the country in one way or another, we demobilized these women who had been active in their own right because we had this focus, a serious focus, on rebuilding the ANC. So many people have pointed out how important uh, initiatives that were getting off the ground, discussions of gender-based violence, domestic violence, rape, or however, 
were, um, you know, essentially uh, those, those, those initiatives were disruptive and uh, compromised in term when there was this shift in focus to rebuilding the ANC and also that these organizations had been demobilized. So yet another um, tendency we might talk about is the fact that, um, you know, an important tendency within the organization that has not been questioned is one that Prince Governor, for example, has called big man politics. And when she entered the parliament, she said, we need to ensure that critics of government policy feel sufficiently comfortable to contribute to debate and participate in decision-making uh, decision processes. Uh, and, what she, and she calls this type of you know, authoritarian impulse big man politics. And has since noted that simply having female chromosomes does not inoculate anybody against that. And she noted, Women can be as good as men and they can be as bad as men when faced with the decision of weighing personal gain and upward mobility within party structures against waging the fight for gender equality. And in fact, many people have pointed out that when the ANC Women's League moved inside the state, they became some of its fiercest gatekeepers, ensuring that reliable ANC women were appointed to parliamentary committees, government departments, and parastatals. Apartments were, appointments were largely driven by party loyalty and political mo mobility rather than a track record of gender activism. Now there have, had always been reservations amongst outspoken and declared feminists as to the capacity of the ANC Women's League to carry out a feminist agenda. Famously, <laughs> Frenick and Wallace said that I don't think the ANC Women's League can liberate women. To assume that it can is ignoring political reality. She also famously said that she never joined the ANC Women's League and told the Mail and Guardian that she most likely never would, um, in particular citing a recent statement that they said that South Africa was, quote, not ready for a women president, which she called both outrageous and unacceptable. And she again pointed out the fact um, that the uh, traditional way in which the ANC Women's League has related both to the ANC and to um, gender struggles within the country has, <clears throat> has, remo has although it was, it was never what, where she wanted to be, has worsened considerably over time. And so I see that I have two minutes, but I think that I've largely pointed out to some of, some of what I've noted in when we think about what has happened over the last 20 years and how can we explain such a huge gap between, you know, uh, such a progressive constitution in many, many ways, uh, such a strong, uh, you might say, um, push for, um, feminizing Parliament, you know, right after 1994, and the situation that we're sitting with now. And so, what I hope to, that I have done at least is to suggest, to suggest some of the trajectories, uh, you know, and some of the reasons why this has happened, and to locate some of those tra trajectories, uh, you know, both in long-standing, um, you might say, long-standing trends that have been inherited from the past but also how those long-standing trend, long trends inherited from the past um, interact dynamically with uh, you know, many of the global political realities, national political, real, political realities, to produce the particular outcome that we see today. to Suzanne and Blair for the invitation um, and uh, although it came with uh, a, a, a question from Suzanne she said but you can't talk about gender <laughs> because we already have a gender paper and so uh, as a gender specialist I, I thought oh my god what am I gonna do um, anyway I'm really happy to be here and, I'm, and it's forced me to, uh, to, to, to bring questions around race and racism out into discussion that are really bothering me and that I need to grapple with and hope that um, all these uh, great uh, scholars here will be able to, to help. So um, so this paper is, is very different in tone and scale from most of what we've been hearing today and uh, different in focus, but there are definitely links to the earlier papers that have mentioned issues around uh, the so-called service delivery protests. Uh, as well as the need for new categories, and I really appreciate Dan's call for that because I think that's what I'm struggling with. I need some new categories. Um, 
And, and I also want in this paper for us to remember the people struggling on the ground. So we've been talking a lot at the macro level, the, po the politics and the economy and so on, really important. But I want to try and bring us back to thinking about the people who are, are suffering on the, on the ground. So this paper is about how to think about race and racism in, as part of these urban pro protests that we're seeing, these uprisings uh, of the urban poor, as some, as some call it. And I, I have not focused a lot on race and racism in my, own, in my own work. I'm not an expert on this. But these issues seem to keep coming up on this topic, and, and so I really want to try and grapple with that. The, the Marikana massacre shocked the world and threw, uh, thrown South Africa's democratic future into question, both home and abroad. But the widespread so-called service delivery protests are also an expression of profound marginalization, inequality, and discontent. And it may even represent a social and economic crisis. Although I certainly agree with, with Hein and others that it doesn't represent some kind of coherent anti-hegemonic uh, social movement against uh, the, ruling, uh, the ruling party. And there's also a huge amount of diversity in these uh, uprisings. Some are really not even something you could call movements. Some of them are very short term and, and, and local in focus. And I also agree with Hein about um, his focus on the importance of the welfare state or the welfare provisions uh, that the ANC has brought in post-1994. And I think to take it even a little bit further, as a really important part of the explanation of people's ongoing support for the ANC at the ballot box. Um, so we can talk about the profound marginalization and exclusion of the poor, but we can't forget the incredible entanglement and connectivity of the poor to the state through pensions and uh, child welfare provisions and so on. So people are not only excluded, they are profoundly connected, and that has a lot to do with political subjectivities, I would think. Um, but nevertheless, these protests do indicate uh, a profound uh, marginalization and deep discontent and a large gap between the promises of a better life for all and the realities for many on the ground. So uh, the urban poor are severely impeded in realizing their right to the city, and I use this concept of the right to city in my work, trying to understand you know, when people come to the city, what do they expect to, to arrive into and, and how can we describe that? Or urban environmental justice is another way uh, to put that. And so they are severely impeded in, in realizing these, um, these, uh, this right to the city, whether we talk about the right to safe and healthy environment, material goods of housing, services, or food, or the symbolic goods of belonging and contributing to the culture and meaning of the city, or the meaningful democratic uh, political uh, part participation in ju not just city governance, but provincial and national governments. Um, this paper explores these issues drawing on the example of the Durban-based Shack Dwellers Organization of Ashladi, or ABM, which is very well known. It's got a, a really extensive web website, international connections, and so on. Although I recognize it's not necessarily typical uh, of uh, a lot of these urban uprisings or the people who are involved in them. But I think it's a very important voice in uh, trying to understand how people are thinking about what they're doing when they're engaging in these, uh, in these protests. So a little bit of context. Uh, the urban geography in South Africa, as many will, will know, um, that profoundly racialized spatial patterns remain, especially for the poor. Uh, we look at how new developments are happening happening with the new townships, the so-called RDP, Mandela House townships. They're all on the peripheries of, of urban, um, uh, urban settlements, so they're already marginalized, they're racialized in the way that these, uh, these developments are happening. Slums and informal settlements are sites of extreme environmental racism in terms of uh, African people being differentially exposed to environmental risks and hazards especially fires, and, uh, pests, and so on, poor housing, lack of services. There is some racial mixing in the elite and middle class neighborhoods happening in some parts of urban South Africa, but that is really the only place where we see some challenges to this legacy of, of uh, racialized uh, uh, spatial patterns. Race and poverty strongly overlap on all, on all measures, as was mentioned this morning. 
whether we're talking about housing, employment, uh, food insecurity, any measure you want to, to make. Um, so despite the end of formal racist laws and the pro-poor and therefore pro-black African welfare programs, despite affirmative action programs, despite the equality-based constitution, and despite official non-racialism and a black majority government, it is still true, and I quote uh, Michael McDonald in his uh, book, Why Race Matters in South Africa, quote, citizens are free of race formally and ideally, not actually and practically. Certainly we can talk about the effects of apartheid legacies uh, that are everywhere there. It will take a very long time to change urban geography, a long time to change education systems and employment patterns. But what I'd like to say here is that there are also new processes of racialization of the poor that are happening post-1994. And these processes are aspects of racialization because although they may not be explicitly uh, a result of, of racist laws or racist policy, in the practice, black people are the main subjects of these practices that exclude, criminalize, and harass. So this is to use the sort of anti-racist kind of uh, tools of analysis. So for example, security and policing strategies that keep poor blacks out of posh urban shopping dis districts and gated communities, pick up vagrants in downtown areas, attacks by police in people's homes for illegal arrest and beatings, these people are usually black, attacks by police on legal and peaceful protests, now Bishladi has talked a lot about, about this, illegal evictions, so people being uh, cleared out of informal settlements and so on, which is completely illegal in, under uh, South African law. These are African people. So Abishladi and Durban has accused police of racism. This excerpt, excerpt from the uh, memorandum delivered to the police in 2007 makes these points, and I quote uh, from Abishladi. Racism. You and many of your officers are guilty of extreme, systematic, and casual race racism towards African people. You insult us in the most ugly language, language which is supposed to be part of the past. When your officers do this stop and search, it is only Africans who are stopped and searched. If there is a line of young men waiting for the taxi, your officers have the colored men and the Indian men and search only the Africans, or leave the colored men and the Indian men, and search only the Africans. Abishladi also commented on the Americana massacre with a painful analysis of the black boors. That is, the black elites running the country as if they were Afrikaners of the apartheid's bitter past. And I'll just uh, read from, um, from their comment, so I'm quoting from them. South Africa has the most beautiful constitution amongst all countries. Its beauty is well documented and respected. But we are living in a democratic prison. The struggles of the past defeated the white wars and brought us democracy with all this beautiful rights on paper. We have so many documented rights, like the right to housing and to protest. But every day our rights are violated by the black wars. They vow to protect our rights, but the vow is a fake vow. They are sending out their securities and police to evict the poor, to lock us out of the cities and to smash our struggles. Instead of working with the people to transform the society, they are repressing the people to protect the unequal society that they took charge of in 1994. For the poor, unemployed, employed or unemployed, things have got worse and they continue to get worse. The arrests, beatings, torture, destruction of people's homes and killing has continued after apartheid. Now the massacre is here too. Every year the black boars tell us to remember 1976, but they say nothing about the repression of our struggles after apartheid. So what can we make of these kinds of statements? How can a black majority government and its security forces be racist? What does the comment about black boars mean? Perhaps it is that many of the poor and black in South Africa still live under apartheid like police brutality and lack of rights. So they, they still are fighting for democracy, for freedom, inclusion, and citizenship. As Abishladi's Zikoda says, we have no country. This is not the democracy that we poor fought for. We must ask, are we citizens of this country? If we are not, then who are we? And where are we? We are on our own. We have no choice but to fight. Now, I don't mean to be tedious here, <laughs> but what about the old race, class, and capitalism debate? 
how do we theorize these relationships? So of course, as many of you are aware, there's a huge literature on race and racism in South Africa. How could there not be? Um, and there's different approaches to understanding the place of race and racism in the production of inequality and injustice. As Deborah Posel has pointed out, South African uh, scholarship, very much unlike North American scholarship, before the late 1990s did not engage much with explicit explorations of what was meant by race um, or through what processes it was socially constructed. There had been, uh, and there are lots of reasons for that, uh, lots of silences around race and racism. And while racism and apartheid were thoroughly rejected as morally corrupt, race categories were to a large extent taken for granted, not the subject of scholarly interrogation. And this I'm still uh, using Deborah Puzzle's uh, insights. Radical scholarship in the 1970s and 80s engaged in a race class, class debate that in the end decided that racism was an aspect of capitalist oppression. Therefore, class and capitalism remained the focal point for analysis. <coughs> Black consciousness of Steve Biko uh, in the 1970s and 80s had a different view. Uh, and post-2000, there will be more post-colonial and post-modern inspired work around race and racialization has, has been happening in South Africa. But the race class debate still underlies some of this work. For example, uh, Jacqueline Koch and others suggest that injustice is no longer primarily about racism in post-apartheid, but an outcome of class relations of capitalist growth paradigm that produces both social inequality and environmental destruction. Jeremy Seekings, who's written a lot about this as well, also suggests class is more important than race in understanding contemporary inequality in South Africa. And he points especially to the widening gap within uh, Africans um, in terms of uh, inequalities. Um, but he also emphasizes, Seekings emphasizes, the profound what he calls race thinking in South Africa constantly reproduced through bureaucratic processes of categorizing everyone into the old race categories. And we had some of that this morning, our need to put quotations around Indian, you know, Asian, and so on. Um, and uh, so we're constantly categorizing into the old race categories, whether on the census or applications for government programs, and especially affirmative actions and BEE programs that entrench and may even deepen racialization and social cultural divides. David Everett, another important scholar on this, argues that official non-racialism of the ANC is essentially incompatible with African nationalism and certainly in contradiction to the race-based policies of redress, that is affirmative action and so on, uh, and therefore has failed. So he's saying non-racialism has failed. Um, racialized identities and separateness have only hardened post-1994, says Everett, and he argues for an anti-racist approach uh, uh, to attack race-based inequalities. I have used anti-racist uh, anti tools earlier to demonstrate how the poor continue to be racialized despite a black majority and seemingly race-neutral laws. However, I'm unsure how far this will take us. Anti-racist approach, uh, anti approaches still evoke utilize and reproduce the very race categories they seek to critique. Uh, Gayhard Marais' new book, I don't know how many have seen it, uh, Declassified, Moving Beyond the Dead End of Race in South Africa, um, just published this year, uh, is trying for a different approach. Uh, like Seekings, he, or like Seekings, yeah, Mari critiques and regrets the continued race thinking of contemporary society and writes in detail about how state policies continually reproduce race categories and hence social divisions. Also, these policies contradict the constitution and official non-racialism. Mari favoring the thinking of Paul Gilroy and Kwame Apia is against race-defined approaches to redressing past wrongs that were race-based. This can only lead to ethnic nationalisms, he claims, populism, and even eventually genocidal actions against ethnic groups cons uh, constructed as out outsiders. Rather, he argues for the use of a utopian vision of non-racialism as a goal to strive for, with the agenda focused on dignity and equality for everyone. He locates the central problem with capitalism, not racism, and so his vision is anti-capitalist in nature. And his focus on dignity and equality really struck me because it, 
twig me back to statements put out by Abishladi. So this links with Abishladi and other groups like them, who also focus on the goal of human dignity and inclusion, mutual respect and human development. The call is to be treated as a human being, a person whose dignity is respected. This requires fair access to decent housing and services, education and freedom, as well as meaningful democratic participation. So the focus is not on ra racial, racial redress, but on continued experience of racism uh, in the contemporary uh, situation. So Abushadi's vi vision is also anti-capitalism, uh, anti-capitalist as capitalism dehumanizes and creates inequalities. As Dakota says, quote, many policies have been passed, many people have voted, but what has been done has not been done for the poor, it has been done for the rich. The poor are outside. So just to conclude, and I promised Suzanne it was going to be short paper, and it is, because I want to hear the discussion. What should our rule as scholars be? If we continue to draw on race-based statistics, as Hein has done, and as a sociologist, what on earth would I do without South African statistics and census? But if we continue to do that, if we continue to draw on race-based statistics and so on, use the race categories in our analysis, are we participating in the continual reproduction of race thinking and trapping ourselves in a place where we cannot imagine our way out of racialization? Is anti-racism or a vision of non-racialism more useful? Something else, those new categories that we need. What about a black consciousness approach? And there are those currently who still promote that which em embraces racial identities as a positive cultural uh, form and a positive cultural force. Do we need to re-theorize the relations of the roles of race and class and capitalism in the reproduction of inequality and dehumanization in this globalizing context? So I'll take questions, and as uh, like the previous two panels, please uh, identify who you are, and we'll take a few questions, uh, let's say three, and then we'll turn it over to the speakers. Hi, Monica. I'm Monica Patterson, here at Carleton. And one of the groups that has been really interesting to me is the Black because it struck me a while that uh, by listening to the panelists, thanks, thanks a lot for that. Um, the disproportionate role assigned to women in social reproduction is, uh, I think, taken as a given here. But there's a, there's a phenomenon that uh, struck South Africa the past two decades, which Dan alluded to, um, I, I mentioned it's my line of work right now, I don't have the time to get into it, it's the HIV TB epidemic. And one of the, one of the um, enormous impacts of that has been to deepen this crushing weight placed on women, not only to keep families going and surviving very, very difficult material circumstances, but in dealing with this epidemic itself. The task of caregiving um, in South Africa generally is, is almost exclusively one uh, deflected on, onto women, young, young uh, and old alike. The task of formally providing health care in order to basically get around the fact that you have a health system which is absolutely incapable of dealing with, with a crisis of this scale uh, in the form of the, uh, the cadres of community health workers, for example, that have been, that have been trained and uh, 
sent into communities, largely women performing this as well. So what's happened through no real fault of any policymaker itself, through except if you want to blame the failure to deal with the epidemic properly when it could have been dealt with, is under enormously trying circumstances, even more responsibility being placed on women to effectively cope with, with a crisis upon a crisis in there. And it's, it's odd to me how seldom this gets acknowledged within South African discourse even, when we talk about the epidemic, because as if it just strikes everybody equally, men, women, white, black, uh, young and old, and of course anybody who looks longer than a few minutes at the, the patterns of this epidemic knows it's one of the most unequal devastations that you can imagine, with women um, there in the absolute the biggest brunt of it. Can you tell us where we are with the Traditional Authorities Act, uh, which uh, seems like it was going to empower some very reactionary forces? Although I did hear plan to Olam Lisa, I think, was defending traditional authorities as a progressive force, potentially. So, do you have an update on that? I don't think there's much for me to respond to, except I could just say a few words for Monica. I think she's still there, yeah, on, on children and youth. And um, I've just done a little bit of research around, uh, because there's this sort of expectation around the born freeze and how will that change the political landscape and voting patterns and so on. And, and the fact that it's often youth that are involved in these um, street protests, especially um, male youth and, and just the profound disenfranchisement that they feel and being left out. And I think some of the um, some of the this discussion goes back to the welfare provision thing and the and the debates around the BIG or the basic income grant that uh, I don't think will ever happen in South Africa but but it tries to address the fact that you've got this whole group and there's a lot of them that are youth but also middle aged uh, men completely left out of any kind of welfare, access to welfare provisions um, as a way of, of perhaps providing people with at least some way to contribute in a, in a positive way. But I don't have much else to say there. I guess um, I'll start with Heinz's question first. And I think what we can see is, so the first half of the day, we looked at you know some of these high level you know macro social processes, right? But they actually are felt on the ground by persons. And like when a state is able to direct all of its attention and care to capital, right? That you can't ask the state for anything. Capital can do what it wants. How does that become possible that human beings can actually still survive? And largely, this is where gender politics come into play. Women's bodies bridge that gap, right? Like as social services vanish, as employment vanishes, it is oftentimes on the bodies of women and women children who are the actual agencies that are able to keep a, so a society reproducing itself as human beings, like the actual material conditions under human beings operate, become more and more impossible. But the way in which it becomes invisible, you know, again, that politics of gender comes in because it doesn't simply frame itself as a class question. It becomes wrapped around all kinds of ideological notions of what women do and what men do and who can say what and who can have forms of violence enacted upon them such that no one will notice. So I think that when we look at what has happened over the last 20 years and those profound shifts that we see, we see that, again, they have been enabled and made possible because the Ultimately, at the end of the day, the persons who are most crushed or who have to, again, bridge that gap, are, are, it's precisely done on the bodies and backs of women and younger people, right? So I would also say, it's so, how, what is it to be an African child, right? To be a child is, has, again, all kinds of ideological notions about it, about being weak and vulnerable, protective, but there is a way in which that anything that can be done to any adult. There is, there is no way in which childhood is a protected category, particularly for you know, African children and youth. So I suppose you're a child because you have less age, but as you pointed out, 
there are so many of these responsibilities that should rightly be put on the state that are put on their backs, and they're precisely the least representative, re representative and it becomes absolutely invisible, um, even though they are actually critical to the reproduction of society. And um, I, I don't know so much about, I thought that it had actually been, um, uh, the Constitutional Court had disallowed it. The, the Traditional Courts Bill, were you saying? That's right. The, sorry? The bill, uh I don't know what it was called, but... Uh, yeah, yeah, I felt like, I mean, as I was, um, you know, doing the final stages of, I had, uh, was prepared, had been preparing this paper as part of a larger project for some time, so the last time I was really working, I thought that the, they had come back and, and um, the Constitutional Court had said no, but I would have to reach out. John? Yeah. Well, uh, just to pick up on Allison's point, because I think it does raise some interesting questions around race class. But truly, really race, class, gender, environment, uh, ethnic identity, etc. I mean, I, all of these things are part of the real mix of the society, and they're all real. I mean, I think that one one of the things, one of the dangers is that we try and we, we forsake uh, multi determined analysis, multivariate analysis, and uh, over determined situations. And I think by, by, we have to be very careful of theoretical approaches that force us to exclude reality. Analytically, and I think that, that, that's the danger of. I mean, I'm not sure where you want to take exactly where you're going, but I think you're moving. You're trying to move away from exclusively a racial discussion, because obviously in South Africa, race is complicated. There are, in fact, lots of very privileged blacks in the new in the new South Africa, but there's no doubt also that people at the bottom feel their oppression not just as racial. I mean, not just as class, but as racially defined as well. Although perhaps the people who are enforcing this so-called racism are, uh, are in fact black themselves, so it's a, these are complicated things, and I think we have to analytically we have to be able to have theoretical approaches that take all of these things seriously. But this is more than an analytical challenge; it's a political challenge too, because if we're going to try and build a movement that builds a better society, it has to be a movement that speaks to what's common, and I think there are common things about these different different uh, sets of, uh, of oppressive categories as they tend to work out in practice so often. And they are about social justice, they are about uh, equality, they are about X, Y, and Z. They're multi, if, if you want to call this, it's social injustice is a multivariate uh, as, as thing too. And I, I find starting, but not for any particularly good reason, except it seems so important, with class is kind of comfortable for me. Uh, and so I would think of myself roughly as a Marxist, I suppose. But I'm not a, I wouldn't want to be a Marxist that was a reductionist, because I don't think you can reduce away these other realities. They're there. We've got to figure out a way to talk, uh, talk about them all, as challenging as that is, as being part of what we have to understand analytically, and also what we have to understand for political practice. We have to find ways in which these differences can speak to each other, because they do hold together. If you think them through, they all come back to an inequality as a reality, uh, and I think uh, that that's maybe a key. So I think you know I don't I don't want Allison to torment herself too much <laughs> uh, about how to make race and class fit. They're both correct, but they're both correct in ways that we have to be subtle enough to figure out that what those connections are, because they don't self-define themselves as being multiply correct. But uh, an analysis that begins to put them together. Is incredibly it will be incredibly helpful, and a politics that helps us to act upon them simultaneously because they're not contradictory. They are simultaneous in their workings and in resistance to them. And we have to really think through very carefully, as Allison is inviting us to do, to to think through what a politics. And I think too, as well, the gender is part of it. And how do we put all these pieces on the table? We can't oversimplify. A reality in order to make our politics more comfortable and easy. And yet that's what a lot of politics does, if you want to call it a crude kind of Marxism. says, well, all these things are important, but class is the real determinant. A crude, crude kind of gender politics says, well, it's about, it's about uh, gender, primarily. A crude kind of racial politics is about black consciousness. It's all of these things. Clive? <clears throat> it strikes me that the principle of equity is overlooked too much by feminists. Uh, in a sense, 
the human rights principle of allowing equal representation at every level, in every capacity, is overlooked and not really. Uh, I mean, it was a principle adopted in the South African Constitution, <coughs> experienced in the first in the first houses of parliament, and can be carried through into a, every area of social and political life. But the principle excludes the interior fights of race and class, which, which are conducted as well. But it seems more of a priority than, than both. And it just strikes me as being a principle that can and should be fought for strenuously. The question of equity in every in every way that women can be seen to be playing a role in every part of the economy as well as social life. I forgot to ask you to um, give us your name. Sorry, I'm Clive Emden. Uh, I'm a journalism student here. Did I give my name? I can't remember. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and you, what's your name? Sorry, my name is Victoria Shore. I'm with the Africa Study Group. Um, this is not as much my field, so perhaps this is tangential. Um, and and I, I just noticed that it wasn't being addressed. Um, in many of the discussions about economic empowerment, we speak about youth entrepreneurship, at least in other conferences that I've been to. Um, but one thing that is often lacking is, is the gendered aspect for entrepreneurship, and mostly in lending. So when women with small businesses and quite often are doing several different jobs at the same time, when they go up and try and ask for capital and loans in order to grow their businesses, they usually have a much more difficult time than young males. Um, and I, I've noticed that this has not come up in our discussions. And if, if you can't get a loan to expand your business, it's very hard for you to then have economic empowerment and to rise up to become one of these high-level CEOs and all of these dreams that you have. Back to you, too. Um, Thanks, John, for the permission not to stress too much. <laughs> I mean, when I start, you have to fret for the right thing. Not, not too much about yeah, put, trying to get the race class thing totally, totally right. But but I think I think I I think I am correct in in thinking that um, working on South Africa sometimes we're afraid to talk about race, and I, and I think it because it has it is so painful, and um, and and contested. Um, so, so I, I think, and I put myself in that category too. So I, I, that was part of what I wanted to do today is to say, let's we have to keep talking about this because this is what people are saying on the ground. So um, whether we get it codified or put into the right categories, I think it matters less that we just keep keep it into the discussion. And I guess to try to put John and Clive's question or comments together, I mean one thing that um, we all know analytically we should think the, th the things together and politically practice the things together. But I think that there's an interesting way in which uh, gender introduces a type of fault line that is even more vexing than race and class in the sense that you can, you know, imagine a form of, of uh, racial nationalism and you can imagine um, it, uh, I mean, we've seen it organized around and groups formed, class the same, trade unions, whatever. Gender, however, you know, and this has been the fault line in South Africa, I mean, first of all, between black and white women, right? Like, seriously, like, the category of women itself is so profoundly um, raised that in many ways, you know, the notion of a black woman is a contradiction in and of itself. You were never afforded many of the protections of a woman, right? So there's, in many ways, that for forever in the feminist movement in South Africa, you know, the ability to organize around gender has been profoundly difficult to do. In the post-apartheid era, it has become even more difficult in the sense of imagining, um, you know, when you have, if you even look at monoracially, the divide between very privileged black women and um, black women experiencing profound disadvantage 
And you know, as they tried, for example, to have the Women's National Coalition or a Women's Charter. I mean, those things prove to be, you know, um, even more difficult for people to imagine what it would look like to organize and to have something like a woman's party, for example, right? So not to say that it's um, impossible or we shouldn't do it, but I do think, I mean, even when you think about uh, in terms of, uh, you know, gender and the way in which it operates, you know, generally persons of the same, you might say, relationship or household occupy the same racial and class category. But even within a marriage, right, within a household, the gender dynamic is there. And we can, I mean, it's interesting that many people have now spoken of, you know, had, had some of the politics of gender around, or the gender politics of people like Cyril and Mbeki been discussed beforehand, some of these ways in which they behave today were not as surprising to some people who knew who, who had, you might say, experienced their gender politics and experienced the way in which they exercise power in those ways. So in other words, like within a single household, there can be a gender divide where the persons share race and class privilege together. And so, you know, again, not to say one shouldn't do it, but I would say that, you know, the fact that there is no so-called women's party and the fact that the ANC Women's League has um, really not been able to even bring any type of coherent gen agenda around gender to their own party, where ostensibly they represent a constituency. Uh, Dan, next. Yeah, um, fascinating discussion. Thank you. Uh, unlike John, I would urge Alison to continue thinking about this and Zina too, because these are you know, fundamental categories that we've used for Wait a minute, I didn't African say she race. should stop thinking. She said she should Please. keep so on. Don't fret, don't fret the, too much. Push the reflection further, more belly Yeah. Uh, more angst. More, more angst. Yeah. Um, as someone who was deeply involved in the race class debate when it first started in South Africa, I'd like to give you a bit of an intellectual history because the issue was actually framed very clearly by a man whom nobody cites anymore, one Pierre Vandenbergi, as he was called in America, uh, who wrote, and I, can't, I don't have it exactly, but something like the following, which outraged people like me. Class, it's referring to South Africa, class, in terms of the relationship to the means of production, exists by definition in South Africa, but has no social analytical sense. Um, so that the first debate began around a group of Marxists, almost all of them, not all of them, but mo mainly white, in exile, insisting, no, it's class, it's not race. So an immediately an opposition, a false opposition, was set up between class and race, and it, the debate was cast in what I would call, and excuse me for this highfalutin theoretical language, ontologically false categories in the sense that they, they presumed those categories of race and class presumed that there was something objectively that is race. Race is. And we can all understand what race is. And class is. And I'm very glad that uh, Alison referred to Jeremy Seekings because when he and Nicola Lerner launched that book on class and race in South Africa, I was invited to be a discussant at Yale. And it struck me that, well, Jeremy, who presented the book, framed it in terms of the opposition between a Weberian and a Marxist concept of race, uh, of class. Marxist in terms of relationship to the means of production, and Weberian essentially in terms of status. And then it became, is it the one, i.e., is there objectively something that we can materially call class that is either status or it is relationship to the means of production? And what troubled me about their analysis although I agree that class is a hugely salient issue in South Africa, that they seem to reduce it to simple, simple income categories. There were, I think, something like 40 classes in South Africa in terms of their analysis, which is just levels of income, which is not very socially useful as an analytical category as far as I'm concerned. So I think that if this debate needs to move around, away from the issue that class is, quote, and race is, and will always be, you know, it's a truism to say these are socially constructed categories, but they also have profound salience and impact on human beings. And I, what I find useful 
in, in dealing with this is something that I've drawn from the different intellectual endeavor I'm in, uh, involved in now, which is inter international relations theory, which is talking about any kind of category. It doesn't exist in and of itself. It believes to, it exists to the extent that people believe it exists and act in terms of that belief. So class will be the dominant salient, salient category when people act in those terms. There are nevertheless what you and I will still understand as class differences, that even though they're not articulated in those terms. Race for, in South Africa clearly means primarily for almost everybody in South Africa, if you ask the question, what does it mean? It means the color of one's skin. And why are we trapped in these apartheid categories? And we are, and we all hate it. Uh, because they have enormous salience still in the, li in the lives of people. So I think that it, it's important to understand that any society throws up what I call its own categories of otherization, which you know have a deeply pro and profound uh, negative consequence in terms of the people who are defined as the other, whether those are race or class or whatever. I have been struck in reading about the country that my ancestors came from, or in my reading on Afrikaner nationalism when I was doing my PhD, or in Quebec, uh, that the kind of similarity of the prejudice that is expressed to people who are not of the group that one, there are, there's a similar intensity of feeling and a, and a similar intensity of exclusion. And in some societies, like South Africa, that is still predominantly racial. There are clearly what we would call class differences that, that impact on people, but these are not cast in stone ontological categories that will always be the same. We have to develop them and define them as we go along. So, you this know, is, I would uh, encourage you to go Some ahead. reasons why this, these are both analytical and political categories, because they aren't exactly the same. But they have political salience. Exactly. They have political salience, but they're, they're social categories before they're anything else. But our political work is to draw out these, what we think to be positive. Well, then it's about the kind of politics that you engage to undo that salience. That's right. You know, and that, that's where the issue of how much you, you know, emphasis you give to so-called class, gender, or race issues comes to play. But I don't think that we can just see, you know, is it class, is it race, is, is racism simply a product of capitalism? Clearly, it's, it is, and it's much more than that. A uh, fellow in the sweater, followed by Daniel, if you could both introduce yourselves. Sure. Uh, I'm Andres. I'm, I'm from South Africa. I didn't mention that before. Um, so I was wondering how long it's going to be until someone brings up Oscar for stories. So I thought I, I may as well be that guy. <laughs> no, please <laughs> don't. Um, I just wanted to say that I the, the way that the media here covered it, they, uh, I don't think really talked about this, but it, it happened within the context of South Africa, um, you know, 20 years or so after apartheid. Um, and uh, a big part of his defense was, um, I thought it was an intruder, which is, um, in, in South Africa happens all the time and often and as violently. Um, but it's, um, there's also a lot of, uh, among white South Africans, I think there's a lot of uh, fear that's based on um, misinformation and bias. Um, uh, I, I don't know. I was w wondering if if you have any perspective on the Pistorius case as a as a case study. You know, as a you know something that happened within this, this context. Daniel. Um, you might want one that one first. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Um, no, I think we can take them. Yeah, okay. we're going uh, in threes. And um, thank you very much for your papers and also your clarion comments and questions at the end of your paper, Alison. So, well, what I thought was quite interesting, again, building on your comments about politics and scholarship, you ended by saying, "What do we do as scholars?" And I'm thinking that that was surprising for me because both of the papers drew a lot on journalists and also from intellectuals outside of academia. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the influence of Fanon on the Shankar's movement. How, do, how are people outside of academia theorizing and conceptualizing their world? And also, 
thinking a little bit more about Steve Biko as well, I was very surprised about how you thought about Biko in terms of race consciousness, when I've thought about him a lot in terms of cultural and political consciousness, um, particularly his desire to get us away from thinking that pigmentation can be linked to black consciousness. And similarly, it, it seems very surprising to me that people would assume that sex is a determination of feminist consciousness as well. So just to think about those intellectuals outside of academia. I just want to remind the group, or uh, tell the group, since we were 15 minutes uh, late getting started with the panel, I'm going to be going to at least quarter past four. Just Okay, well, I'd like to start by thanking, is your name Daniel? In the, okay, because I was about to catch myself on that as well. So there was a way in which when you're talking in colloquial shorthand, gender becomes women, which is not the case, right? So everybody lives in a, everybody lives in a profoundly gendered social formation. And you could actually, you can't imagine organizing politically around conceptualizing and talking about, uh, you might say, around the analytical frame of uh, transforming gender relations in a society, which has yet to happen, but is will bring you further along the road than a women's party. But nevertheless, we do have to recognize that persons labeled or categorized as female have a very particular history and experience. And so that kind of, it wraps back to the Pistorius question, right? Because uh, Pistorius is, what, what, again, one of those interesting things where, you know, real life is always such a more damning puzzle than analytical categories are, are presented. So, I mean, what you have here, which many people have noted that not only did he say he was responding to an intruder, but the way in which he was authorized to respond to the intruder with deadly force, without thinking that you would lose your head, was because it was a imagined black intruder. So, you know, that was clearly the way that that, that was framed. At the same time, there is a person using that analysis or that frame who has a very long history of violence directed against his intimate female partners. So again, as a way of, it is, when we try to sort of, we have to disentangle them analytically, that's how we, we think about the things, but the way in which those things were so deeply wrapped together, right, that they are almost, they're very, very difficult to disentangle. That it was as key that, you know, it was violence against an intimate partner, a woman who had slept with him before and all of that, what he was authorized to do. If he went and just killed a random white woman on the street, it would have been quite different. And then again, the ways in which doing that, enacting violence against her, can be authorized and thought of as because there was this, I live in the society with all of these crazy, scary black people in it, right? And so the way in which then to, I mean, I guess it kind of reminds me of when Mbeki gets so upset, or when Mbeki would say, stop telling us what to do about Zimbabwe West, you tell us what to do all the time. The urge to say, there they go again, you know, demonizing the black other, or, to say, or again to say, they, people never react this way, black women are killed every day. But nevertheless, not also wanting to discount the fact that intimate forms of partner violence are equally as damning for white women, but how, black women. But how difficult it is for a woman of color to see that the way in which it makes headlines is if it is of a particular woman of a particular color in a particular heterosexual relationship. So again, you know, the ways in which these things are presenting themselves to us in real life every day, especially now are ways in which the old even categories of responses are so difficult, right? It's a way of, um, you might say like, it is, it is impossible to simply, re it, uh, one couldn't divide oneself in half and react to it as a black person with outrage that about, you know, X part of it, and as a woman with outrage about a Y part of it, but a recognition of, uh, you know, I call that this is bullshit on another part of it. So I don't think that I'm answering your question necessarily, um, but to point to things like Oster Pistorius are exactly why we need these new, completely new, I think, analytical categories. Because, I mean, it began in colonialism that 
gender was the language within which racial difference is expressed, right? That it is not just that they are savage and other, but we can recognize their savagery and otherness and code it in gender-based, in gendered language. However, also resistance, even black consciousness, it is rescuing black, but often it is because of the threat to black masculinity that oftentimes nationalist movements are framed, right? So now that we have moved forward in time, I'm not so big on progress, but nevertheless, many as more voices have emerged to speak of these things, the contradictions can't be so easily papered over, but it doesn't make them any easier when our analytical categories were developed precisely at the time when we were largely papering over those things. Thanks for doing that work. <laughs> well done. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know what to add to that. Um, that really, really quite brilliant uh, statement. But yeah, certainly Abishladi is very big on Klanon. I mean, they, they definitely draw on that. On that. But um, I, and I think, yeah, the, the Steve Rico thing too. Again, I'm not an expert on this. I'm just at the very beginning of trying to understand these influences and these thinkers, um, but you know, I, I, I think what I understand Abu Shladi's, uh take on a thinker like Steve Biko is exactly what you say. Like it's a, it's a focus on humanity, right? It's a focus on, on human dignity and the, the respect of one for the other and everyone's right to, uh, to exist. And I think the difficulty in, in this is that in a context where racial categories are accepted and and um, as as the as obvious and not interrogated as self-evident that something called black consciousness becomes very difficult to separate from that that milieu of hardened racial categories that that are not being interrogated as socially constructed we might say they are but we don't actually then go ahead and interrogate them so the we? Yeah. Well, just thinking about what that might mean in terms of a, a progressive politics, I guess. No, in no, some no I mean, you said we are not interrogating them. Who is the we in that state? The we? Yeah. Well, most things that I'm reading coming out of South Africa are still reproducing those categories in a way that does not interrogate them. Those sources are scholars, journalists? Yeah, scho well, scholars and journalists, yeah. I have myself down next, um, so I'm going to just quickly ask this, and I want to frame it like this, it's about violence against women, and um, this is how I want to ask this part, because there's so much to say and so much to ask. I'm wondering, in South Africa, has the murder of Reva Camp, a beautiful white woman, has it somehow, has it injected a new life or any life into the, the long-standing problem of violence against women? Has it made the issue take on any more urgency? And I ask this as a Canadian, and I know you're not Canadian, so to give you a little bit of quick, quick background, there's a big scandal that's just happened in Canada in the last couple of weeks where a very high-profile cultural elite man, a guy named Gian Gameshi, oh, has remember. been, you know, know, you have been following, oh, okay, know, okay, so some of the women coming forward are, are white mm -hmm. and educated, there was one woman who's come forward publicly um, who's a woman of color, he's a man of color, so I think this racialization discussion needs to happen, I think it's part of what's happening, and the reason I think that is because Aboriginal women have been demanding accountability for at least a thousand missing and murdered Aboriginal women, and I'm sure the number's much higher. We know about this, that they've been demanding, you know, studies, etc., and the government, and I think the wider society really doesn't care because they're Aboriginal. So I'm just wondering, has this Steven, the, the Reva murder, has it changed anything, I suppose, in the South African context around discussion of violence against women? Then there was Carolyn, and then there was you. Carolyn. Yeah. Uh, Carolyn. Um, in a way, I would say really want 
referring to, for example, I'll sit the Bible on um, occasion, we ask you questions that may be seen as politically troubling to people who are in, in some of these questions, like uh, how come the police have not been, uh, how come the practices of, of the police reproduce some of the racist behavior that stand back from the apartheid period, from the colonial period, and so on. Um, how do we ask these questions without being completely dismissed for asking them the first place? Like, there's a reason. There's a reason maybe that people need to read books and all these little handful of theories and things to interrogate this. But um, there's probably a lot more thinking that can be done. I know there are other theories as well. There's more thinking that can be done. I think they're really troubling questions, maybe more so than questions about the things about the past. Yeah, Joe Holmes, uh, I'm an alumni. I had a question about the education. I've got kind of two parts. Uh, one is how well is the educational system working? Like are the lot of boys and girls equally being educated, especially for uh, black children and that, how that's working out. Uh, the second part is that like during the apartheid days in the 80s, uh, a lot of kids dropped out of school as a protest and that. And I'm just wondering whether that's rippled through the system and caused unemployment or maybe contributed to crime or you know how has that happened as far as these kids that have dropped out of school I don't know if there's a movie by uh, uh, Whoopi Goldberg I think it's Sue Nefrina or something like that Serafina? about her as a school teacher yeah Serafina. Serafina yeah I have it at home it's actually a very good movie uh, kind of gets into the school system during the apartheid days but I was just wondering how the mm -hmm. educational system is working out I could just make a comment. This probably comes from Hein's book, as <laughs> so many things probably do. But I, I think many have said that uh, the, the education post-1994 has been one of the weakest elements of, of what the state has actually been able to, uh, to improve. And so, there, yes, there's been expansion of enrollment, but the quality and the resources that are available for um, poor and rural or poor township um, kids is absolutely appalling. Um, and so there's there's a lot of questions around that, but just bus linking back to the uh, the discussions around race and racialization too, as just from scanning the literature recently to prepare for this, so there's some of the interesting work that's starting to be done is about uh, multiracial school experience in South Africa. So so actually new research being done with youth um, kids, well mostly youth I think in university level. Of, of, of students that are now in multiracial classrooms and multiracial institutions and what does that mean for racialization and understanding of race and categories and how these things are negotiated and is an institution um, culturally white and what does that mean and you know how do people so I think there's some really interesting stuff um, just to address Carolyn's question too of that people are starting to grapple with these questions uh, on the ground in South Africa. So as outsiders, as always, we have to take our cues from what are people interested in there? What are they talking about? And how can we contribute, support, be part of those discussions? I mean, I know that's all I have to do. School there. Okay. <laughs> yes, that's it. Oprah's school is something else. Yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I guess for the steam camp thing, I mean, I think, again, there is a way in which it won't do, the, the, the spectacularization of a case like this actually ultimately works to shut down conversation, right? Like everybody goes back to, and ultimately it yeah. reconfirms that men can hit their women, and those other men better not hit our women, but may, uh, we can hit and do whatever we want to our women. And, you know, there's a way in which I, I just actually feel like Although it, it should be a space to open up the fact that women of all levels of income and elite status cannot save you from being the victim of, of intimate partner violence. And what that means, so to get to talk beyond about what then, what is the source? Because oftentimes when men without much money hit women without much money, we say it's because they're poor and they don't know anything or aren't that. It becomes again a way in which part of the framing of black otherness and beastliness is, you know, rampant violence, right, of a sexual nature. 
So it, it would be nice if it opened up to space to say, then how do we understand if we have this phenomenon that spans classes, how, you know, spans income levels, uh, spans, you know, there's, all, there's intimate partner problems with LGBT. Okay, how do we then think about it? What do we use? Because all of our shorthands, it never gets there. Like the spectacularization becomes a way to actually stall all other types. And I, I feel like it flames out completely. Like analog everything. I would say it's interesting, go, is your name Caroline? Well, I do. Well, it's so funny when people always can't we ever get beyond race. They always think like, you know, black, white, what have you. But I actually would say we have many examples where people have, for example, in Americana, the fact that the people they were shooting were black didn't stop them for a second. And we have <laughs> multiple examples of this, which does tell us analytically that because a certain type of, of framing of the problem before, we would suggest that there, because we often still think this about white people, there is something about that in there that just makes you act a certain way towards your own people. What we have at least, we've seen over here in this instance is remarkable examples of the fact that people having the same shade of skin doesn't really, again, drive what they can and cannot do to one another. And of course, we've seen this over history. I mean, uh, as Barbara Field says, throughout, you know, the English, the Irish, Throughout history, people have enslaved people that looked like they were. They've done, but we have now, at a particular moment, arrived to think that color difference makes people do things, right? So analytically, we very much have to get past that without saying that we have to ignore it. But I do think that this type of deep historicization we need to go back to because we become trapped on this terrain such that we were not moving well analytically. So I think you're, you've arrived at exactly the right place. And I don't think, actually, you're, um, I don't read it as like, oh, well, white scholars are always calling us to, I don't read it as getting beyond race in that kind of, like, multicultural fair kind of way. I'm actually, I, I actually see you saying something very different. So I know it's quarter past four, but we do have, I'm going to take one more round of three questions, and then we'll wrap it up. So Linda, and then I think Daniel wants to respond, and then Dan had his hand up. I was struck that the way in which Abhlali has been presented today is very different than what I read about it. Um, and I mean, I think a sign that things are not all in order was the huge debate about the support which they gave to the DA, because they yeah. gave the ANC yeah. so on. But much more serious was the debate um, among groups that had formerly um, taken them very seriously, but who now argue that as a movement it is diminished and not finished that there are so many tensions between the leader and, and the group, that there's been an involvement of people at the NGO level and from academics which have muddied the waters. I didn't get any sense of that confusion and turmoil and critique from your talk. Daniel, do you want to respond? And then Dan, and then we're going to thank our panel. Yeah, thank you. Um, just a brief point. I, just the comments on the idea that we're only starting to begin this work. I think it's a really important action. But Lewis Gordon, one of the most prominent integral coaches of Steve Biko, has done, drawn our attention to the idea that David Field Goldberg, a white South African, can be claimed as an Africana philosopher for a number of years, since the 1980s, really. Um, th this work isn't just beginning. Um, where we can say that we can engage with different types of work and why I wanted to draw our intellectuals outside of academia is to draw our attention to the conceptualizing and the philosophical work of stand-up comedians like Trevor Noah, um, musicians like Lucy Mahasela, and different people who are helping us think through gender, race, power, and authority. Dan, I guess you yeah, have Yeah, I wanted to just come back question. to Steve because, uh, because I think a lot of what we say about Biko now decontextualizes him from his own historical context. I mean, the term black consciousness in 1973 meant something, or 1968 when it was first used, meant something very different to what it means today. The term black was not used in South Africa in the 1960s. It was not an official racial category, and nobody referred to blacks. Uh, Biko said himself that he borrowed it from you know, from Stokely Carmichael, um, but that the use of the term black was a deliberate attempt, attempt to deconstruct racial categories. 
uh, to say that no, we are not Khalids, we're not quote Indians, and we're not quote Bantu or natives or Africans or whatever the you know the big fight about, which was a politically correct term to use. So that was a it was a political strategy and it was a cultural strategy and it was pushed very very far. It's become reinterpreted uh, since since that time, and it was a profoundly non-racial concept. I mean, there was not a racist or racial bone in Steve Biko's because body, it was psychologically very shocking as a privileged white person to meet a black person who treated you exactly as his equal. You know, in South Africa, that was a phenomenal thing at the time. But the other point about it, which is also, it, it, is we tend to stress less, and there's a point that Daniel referred to in the past, that this was a strategy of first and foremost of psychological uh, liberation that Biko argued, and I think hard to disagree with him, although lots of people did at the time. The domination is interior, it's internalized. And that the only way that South Africa was going to be liberated if all communities started to look at their own ways in which they inter interiorized their racial categories at the time and work against them. And that his refusal to work with white students in a joint political organization was not because he was a racist, was because he said the conditions of my psychological domination are different from the psych conditions of the psycho domina psychological domination in your community. Go and work with that. So, you know, I, I really regret the transformation and passing of black consciousness, I think, was a hugely important um, uh, moment in South Africa. And the way that the ANC managed to recuperate it for its own ends, it, in fact, uh, took the sting out of it as a, as a political force, and that's regrettable. Yeah, I mean, I wonder, I mean, in, in my um, neophyte way, I'm, I mean, I'm wondering if that's what Mare is trying to get at in his book, Decai, you know, so he's, he's trying to, to reinvigorate an, a, a vision of non-racialism. And with, without, at the same time, not suggesting that race doesn't exist as a real force and racialization is real, but, you know, I just wonder if that's what he's trying to also do is, is recall some of the the power of, of that, um, that I don't I don't know. Well, he's also an Afrikaner, you know. I know, yeah, I know. He's to liberate himself from the cultural categories of his own community. That's right, yeah. Um, but just on the Abishladi, I totally un I agree with you, and I'm not actually trying to write on Abishladi as a movement, as an organization, or anything like that, because I haven't, I haven't uh, done enough research on it, but I'm certainly aware of all these various things that are going on, these contradictions. Uh, the DA support was absolutely bizarre to me uh, during the election. Um, but I think the, the point that I'm trying to make here is simply the articulation of a particular kind of um, uh, position and understanding of what's happening to slum dwellers in, this, in contemporary society. So that's, why, that's what I take from that is really how that's being articulated by people in that position. Not so much, is this a successful social movement? What's the nature of the social movement? Who's involved, who's not involved? But obviously those things are, are really important. I'd just like to say I really appreciate that the comment about edu uh, of the com comedians and other spaces yeah. of intellectual activity. I'd like to look into your comment about schools. Because I do think that, um, you know, obviously I work in school, I got tons of education, I know it's important, but people are not poor because they don't have enough education. I mean, there's like this way in which neoliberalism makes it that people are poor because they don't have enough schooling. No, they are poor because of these economic structures. And then school becomes a way to blame the victim for, you know, their failure to succeed in a game that is rigged against them, right? And it gets precisely into then the school as a, becomes fetishized as this site of the productive knowledge. And I have more than you because I have more degrees and I'm smarter and I have to go and get it in a book and all of this. And as you've pointed out, you know, all of these people that we are, we're caught, we are discussing from the gentleman at the back, <laughs> Heim, who said, you know, to Steve Biko, many, most, many people said very, very important, profound things that don't have PhDs. In fact, more, more profound things because you're not, you know, hemmed in by the, you might say, trajectory of education that tends to breed radicalism and thought right out of you and push theories in. So, you know, there is a way in which uh, you know, discussions become solely centered around if we opened up access to schools, it would eliminate, it would do something substantial about poverty. 
you know, which ultimately, of course, open up access to schools, education is great, but people are not poor because they don't have enough schooling. And related to that, people, the people's knowledge is not necessarily so compromised because they haven't gone through schooling. All right, please join me in thanking our wonderful last Just a, a few minutes to remind you that Octopus Books is here for people.